but it's, it's something we need to talk about more. It's something that these young people uh, deserve. I could go on forever. I'm going to stop. Rachel, you are so, so welcome here today. I met Rachel last year at a conference in Ely Diocese, and I just thought, wow, she has so uh, many things that we could learn from. Um, uh, please do talk to Rachel uh, throughout the morning later on. Rachel, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, we are all ears. Bless you. Rachel, over to you. Well, thank you, and good morning. How are you today? I brought the sun with me all the way from Ely, since that's where I live, and I'm sure it's always here in Ipswich, is it? Is it always sunny in Ipswich? <laughs> well, thank you so much, Rhiannon, for that lovely, warm invitation, and indeed to Karen, who I've been liaising with. It is genuinely a joy to be with you on this Saturday morning, but not just to be here to meet and greet, and as I said, hopefully chat over coffee and so on. But I genuinely sit there, and I'm sure like some of you or many of you actually feel like if you cut me inside, actually youth is absolute in my core of my being. I am passionate about youth ministry, about having ministry in the church that is distinctively Christian in reaching out to our young people. But just as Rhiannon said, and others indeed as well, that actually we as the church are absolutely well-placed, aren't we, to pour into the hearts and lives and just do stuff in the raw, in the mess, in the challenge, in the pain, in the trauma, in the well-being, in the anxiety, and indeed in the joys of all of life that young people go through. So um, hopefully we're on this journey together, aren't we, of just saying, Lord, how will you use us in our places and spaces? Whether that is because you're sitting here, as we heard earlier, with five or ten young people in your church community, whether you're sitting here at the moment with none, but with a bursting sort of passion to say, God, give us some to get started, and how do we do that? Or whether you've got 20, 30 or so on. Actually, my, my prayer for us today is that even as we sit here, as we chat to each other, that we will just hear that still, small voice of God's little nudge as to what we can do. Whatever context we're in, urban, rural, however young we are, however old we are, I'm going to steal our thunder of the panel question, which I know has come up earlier, and put it right out there from the beginning, if that's okay, to say my belief is, is that you're never too old for youth work. Because young people need people who are caring, accessible, journey alongside them and who will pour into their lives. And whether you're 20-something or 80-something, my belief is, is that you can be the most significant voice in young people's lives. Anyway, I'm going to stop there and start again for telling you a little bit about myself. But hopefully you gauge. I'm passionate about us seeing how we can take the good news of Jesus into the lives of young people and be used alongside that. Let me introduce myself. As you heard, my name is Rachel Heffer. Um, I live in Ely. I'm married to Darren, who's the director of an architect's practice, and we have two teenage boys. So I am grappling with all the challenges of what it is to have a 13-year-old and a nearly 16-year-old now, one of them certainly much taller than me, another one trying to catch me up um, as quickly as possible. And I minister um, amongst our young people at the Countess Free Church, which is a Baptist church in Ely. Um, I grew up in Leicester and was part of a lively inner city Anglican church from 0 to 18 and was really invested in, in that place. Um, I think, Rand, as you said, you know, being invested in as a young person is incredibly powerful. Um, and in that place of me growing up from 0 to 18 and I went on to lead um, summer camps to invest in lots of areas of youth ministry, it was in a small church youth group environment that I was pushed, encouraged, asked to get involved, to be alongside the adults when I didn't feel I had anything to offer or anything to say. But isn't church a great place to be able to try, fail, make mistakes, be encouraged and get up and keep going? So I'm very grateful um, looking back. In my church at the moment, we have probably about 13 or so young people. And in that place over the last 10 years, I've been leading a girls' day conference called Shine, where we've invested in our teenagers. We have a mentoring program, which I'll speak a little bit about in the workshop um, later on, about how the whole church can get involved in mentoring young people. Um, and again, I'm very involved in just having a group of particularly young girls, again, with an all safeguarding elements come to my house every five or six weeks um, sprawl all over my couches and sofas as Rhiannon said pizza marks or popcorn down the sides whatever it may be but in that space 
we do life and faith together. And it's incredibly precious, a real privilege, and challenging at times too. So that's my, my home backdrop in terms of the local. My role is I serve at the Evangelical Alliance as head of mission. So in that role, I try to, with our teams based, based in London as I am, two days a week and working at home for the rest, but I help to spin the plates of both our team based in London and our offices in Wales, Northern Ireland, Scotland, to really be championing church leaders and those involved in ministry. Our heart call as a unity organization is to really pray on, champion, cheer on the local church in all aspects of ministry. And of course, at the heart of that being what we can unify around in terms of mission and evangelism. So that's a little bit about me. I'll tell you just a tiny bit about the wider scope of, um, of the Evangelical Alliance as well. And as you can see over there, if you're interested, please do come and chat to me later or see some of our resources. As I said, in terms of for you here as Ipswich Deanery and the wider diocese, our hope as Evangelical Alliance is that in all those aspects of ministry, we'd be able to cheer you on, equip you, resource you, come and speak, come and journey alongside, because we really just want to, as our strapline says, together make Jesus known. So a few um, just highlights of resources, you can have them on the slide, please, just to whet your appetite, and then we'll move on, are these. We love to equip and resource parents, as well as youth leaders, ministry leaders, church leaders. And Time to Talk is a resource that came out just earlier last year to really equip parents and youth leaders around those gritty conversations of sex and relationships and what's on our RE curriculums in our schools. So that's a resource that really helps to equip places um, and to get us involved, as we heard earlier, to really look at the schools that we might adopt in our premises as well. So the next slide, please. We heard a little bit, didn't we, on that um, film, which was both fascinating and worrying, wasn't it? Um, looking at some of that culture that is around us in the wider sphere, but also right in the eye line, as I see with my two boys as well, of just what's going on in our culture. And a resource called Being Human from the EA really looks to actually encourage how the church can engage in aspects of culture. Some of these big hitter conversations and questions that are right in front of us and our young people. If that's of interest to you, that's a small group resource as well, which might serve you well. On to the next slide, please. We've talked a little about, for young people, for older people, it's all about relationship, isn't it? Drawing alongside people. My wonderful colleague, Phil Knox, has written this book, which sits alongside much of the research we'll look at in just a moment, but called The Best of Friends, which encourages us, again, as the church, as individuals, to look at how we can use the power of intentional friendships to get alongside people. And lastly, the next slide, please, just say if any of the work of Evangelical Alliance can serve you, encourage you, resource you, please do contact um, or indeed join us so that together we can have a voice not only into the church, but actually into the corridors of power, where many of my colleagues who are in Westminster every day of the week um, are actually speaking into many of the policies that are coming out around whether it's education or gender or sexuality or you name it, actually to have a Christian voice into that mix is something we'd love you to join um, with us in. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of a flavour of what we do at the EA anyway. Outside of that, I want to just draw us back in on our next slide, please, to just remind us of this verse, which I believe we've heard a couple of times already, which is the heart of today's conference, which, as you can see, is this from Psalm 78. It's a verse that I love because, to my mind, it comes with a promise, doesn't it? It says, God gave his law to Jacob's descendants, the people of Israel, and he told our ancestors to teach their children so that each new generation would know his law and tell it to the next isn't that our heart today? Not only that we would draw alongside and hopefully seek God in who or which young people God might have us to minister to, but in order that not only for them today would they in the mess, in the drama, in the challenge, in the joys, the highs, the lows of their lives, not only would they have something of the truth of the gospel implanted deep within them and have an encounter with Jesus, but actually beyond that, the promise is that it's not just for them, is it, that it would be for many generations to come. I love that, that there's a sense of action, of movement, but it's also a promise for generations to come. And this next verse is another one um, that is important to me, which says this, Psalm, uh, Proverbs 22, which says, Start children off in the way they should go, and even when they're old, they will not turn from it. Again, I don't know about you, but that is my heart cry for my own boys. If you're a parent, if you're a grandparent, 
if you're a godparent, an uncle and auntie, as we mentioned earlier, isn't that heart, your heart cry? That actually we want to be people who just gently get alongside, pray for, minister to, pour something into the lives of our young people. That actually we just want to start them off and we pray and trust that God will take them on that journey. So that helps frame maybe just a little of where we're going um, during the course of this morning, doesn't it? That we want to be people who can discern what God's given us in our current context, um, but then be able to pour into that. And my belief is, is that every single one of us, every single one of you, God can use to minister to a young person. If you reflect back, as we did earlier on your own life, who invested in you? My guess is, and I won't get you to answer it, my guess is it was somebody in close proximity to you. It was a family member or a friend, or it might have been a football coach or a scout leader or somebody else involved in your life. But think of that person, and I wonder actually how you might think then of who God has put around you and who he might use you to minister alongside. If you're not already, there may be many that you're already investing in, which is brilliant. I just want to take the next little while, if that's okay, to unpack for you just some of the Talking Jesus research. It was mentioned just earlier um, by our wonderful host that in front of you, you have a Talking Jesus report, and that's for you to not necessarily need to dig into right now, but I'd love for you to take that away if it might serve you or be of interest to you. Hands up for me, anyone who's heard of the Talking Jesus research, and don't worry if you haven't. There's quite a few. Brilliant. Okay, well, what I'd love to do is just to help us with looking at the landscape and the culture in which we're in, I'd love to just share with you some of the findings that come from this research, if that's okay, which paints the big picture of a piece of research that was looking at the state of faith across the UK. So if you bear with me, it will be a bit of a whistle-stop tour. But what I'd love for you to do is, as you listen, as you engage to some of these findings and the headlines that came out of the research, let's put the lens on it, which whilst this was a re piece of research amongst UK adults, actually it has a lot to bear and to tell us about the world of young people as well. And I'll mention later, there has been some brilliant research done specifically targeting young people that has come out of organisations like Youthscape, Script Union, Youth for Christ, Urban Saints and others, which again seems to all be saying very much what the Talking Jesus report also says. So is that okay? Are you holding on to your seats? Let's go for it and um, we'll, we'll go through some of these statistics together. So on the next slide, let me tell you a little bit about where this came from. The Talking Jesus research was originally done, first piece, this piece here you see before you was launched about 18 months ago, almost two years, but the original piece of research in 2015 came from a group called the Denominational Leaders Summit who were a bunch of um, denominational heads or heads of networks who said, wouldn't it be great if rather than just story-based or anecdotally, actually if we really knew what the landscape looked like across the UK, for example, wouldn't it be great if we knew what non-Christians' perception of us as Christians was and what non-Christians' perceptions of the church was, but also it'd be really helpful to know what as Christians, as individual practicing Christians, how we felt about that individual uh, individual personal witness so that's where it came from and out of that group of leaders a stack of money was thrown at a brilliant um, UK research body called Savanta Comres and the questions were asked and the survey was undertaken and what came out of that survey was so overridingly positive that those leaders didn't believe it that they thought surely there can't be positive reflections about the church or about Christians. And so basically a bit more money was put back in the pot, they delved a bit deeper, and thankfully what came out was a resoundingly positive piece of research, which has since gone on to shape many people, just like your church communities, visions and evangelism strategies in their churches, and it really made its mark in many church communities. So we decided that we'd love to repeat this research five years on, but of course if you look back to 2015, add five, you hit 2020, in came a global pandemic. It wasn't the best time to conduct a piece of national research. So we went again at the start of 2022. You can see there in front of you, it was 4,000 UK adults, so a really credible piece of research, which is important for us to know, isn't it, as we get started. But let's not hang around there. I'm going to whiz us through to look at some of those um, key findings. So on the next slide, please. It told us 
that just like the census, the last census that came out, again, none of that news which shot to the headlines um, was a surprise to us because we knew that actually from people who were asked, if you were to tick a box across the UK as to your religious identity, what would you say or what box would you tick? We found that if you put those top two together, that 48% of the UK would tick a box to say that they would affiliate to being a Christian. 6%, as you can see there right at the top, would say that they would call themselves a practicing Christian. So again, that was very close to the 46.2% that came out of the national census, 48% here. But 6% is our team, if you like. That's those of us who would say we're a practicing Christian. So that were people who would say they'd go to church at least monthly and would read the Bible and pray weekly. So that's our kind of team. So as we look at the impact of mission, evangelism in our communities and across the UK, that's where we're at. Nowhere near where we'd like it to be, but it gives us a good start, doesn't it? Next slide, please. We ask people, and again, think maybe what some of people in your churches or even your young people might say. We ask people to say, okay, if you think about the person of Jesus, how would you describe him? And what we saw was this, that whilst 33% of the UK said they thought Jesus was a good man, but a spiritual leader, maybe a prophet, but not God, what we did also see is that 20% of people across the UK said that they believed that Jesus is God. Isn't that encouraging? Don't you think if you sit around a table, one in five people would say that they believe that Jesus is God? And I wonder if, if you're thinking of maybe your grandchildren, your children, your people in your youth work, I wonder what they would say. And some of the research shows that, again, there is a real sense of young people having a recognition of the person of Jesus. Um, and again, not so many peop young people saying that they don't think that God exists. So one in five people across the UK would say they believe Jesus is God. The next slide shows, again, we've just come out of Easter, haven't we? Hopefully you all managed to just about have a bit of a breather after a busy Easter period. But we asked this question too. No matter what you know about the wider Christian story, God's story, what is your belief about the resurrection? And we found here, if you put those top two together, that actually 45% of the UK would say that they believe in the resurrection. I don't know about you, but that really surprised me when we heard that. That is a whopping great percentage, isn't it? 45% of people believe in the resurrection. That's really good news with people younger and older to say, okay, well, if you believe that, what else do you know about God's big story? And it's a great starting point, again, with our young people to actually just open-handedly say, what do you know about God? What do you believe about God? Assuming that, as we've said earlier as well, actually, our theological and Bible literacy is really low, isn't it, for so many of our young people. But that shouldn't be a threat or concern to us, but actually a challenge to say, how do we actually just get them talking about all things of God? And how do we interject and just pepper our conversations, if you like, with something that brings truth and hope and something of God's story to them? Let's move on from there onto the next slide. We went on to ask those outside of the church some questions. On the next slide, it um, shows us that one of the questions asked of our UK adults was this. If you were to even start to explore faith, where would you go? And this is what we found. It may not surprise you, especially off the back of the video that we've just seen with people, both adult and younger, that the top answer, as you can see there, um, at 26% was Google. I don't know about you, but I would go to Google for pretty much everything. And so it shouldn't surprise us, should it? Actually, isn't that fascinating that as people want to explore faith, Maybe asking some of the questions they might not actually want to feel a bit silly about asking their friends or feel that they should know. They might actually type into Google, you know, what is a Christian? Is there a God? Is Jesus a real person? And all those questions, because that's safety and anonymity. Um, and my guess is from working with some of my young people as well, of which I interact with on a daily basis, many of them um, in Ely, that actually they're asking those big questions too. And it's not only 26%, but if you look at the bracket below with YouTube, which many of our young people go to YouTube or TikTok, 36% of people across the UK would say that they go to the digital presence first. So that should hopefully not only interest us and make us think about our own websites, our church websites, the communications that we have with our young people, um, how we use our own social media, but actually that's the first and foremost place that people both young and old would go to even ask some of those questions. So how could we use that creatively within all realms of safeguarding to, to actually again just engage with our young people and again those in our wider community. 
Just um, back on the previous slide for a moment, please. Um, the second top answer, which, again, hopefully is an encouragement to us, is that when we ask where people go to explore faith, you can see 22% of people said that they'd go along to a local church, but the joint top answer is 22% said they'd go to the Bible first. Now, I've had many leaders say to me, as I've presented on this research now to thousands of church leaders over the last couple of years, and so many have said, Rachel, is it a bad thing that I'm really surprised that the Bible comes out so high in terms of where people would engage? Um, I don't know what your response would be, but mine has been, no, that's not a bad thing. But isn't it a timely reminder for us that with people old and young, that actually the word and the truth of the Bible can be absolutely transformative in their young lives as much as in ours. So I think it's a timely reminder for us to get creative as well as to how do we communicate the truth, the stories, the drama, the adventure of the Bible into a young person's context. And my encouragement on you, just that as I just pause and reflect myself for a moment, is let's not shy away from the Bible. I was reading the story of David and Goliath recently, and as I was, um, because I was speaking on it and doing a children's talk on it, and I dug out my message Bible, I dug out my youth Bible, and I dug out my NIV, and I read it again in the youth version. I was like, this story is amazing. You know, every single version um, or every single story in the Bible could be a whole feature film in itself, couldn't it? So many. And you think, actually, when the words of life and truth and courage and character And, you know, all of these things come together. You think, why wouldn't that connect with the heart of a young person? It's got drama in the stories of the Bible, just as they see in the playground or in their own friendship group. So let's not shy away from, again, those stories, the impact, the transformational value of the Bible. Let's move on from there onto the next slide. 53% of people across the UK said that they know a practicing Christian. There's an alert here for all of us and a challenge. I love this research because it comes with great encouragement, but it also comes with great challenge, which is a good place to be. But the alert here is that seven years ago in 2015, when we did this research, this was actually 68%. So it's dropped quite significantly. The challenge I feel from that is we need to be people who make ourselves known. We need to let people know that we're Christians to our neighbors, to our young people to those young people who might be in our communities, out at the bus stops in the morning or whoever it may be, on the football pitches. Because actually, who knows where actually in a time of need or a time of seeking a trusted adult or a conversation, they might just come to you knowing there's a bedrock of faith. Even if they don't understand it, they might just know that you're the person to come to. So 53% of people know a practicing Christmas. uh, Christmas? Where did that come from? Know a practicing Christian. But what do they think of us? Well, the next slide, um, sorry, this, let me come back to that. This slide tells us that they know us really well, first and foremost. I'll keep you hanging as to what they think of us. They know us, they know us really well. We're in close proximity. 33% of people, when they think of the practicing Christian they know, would say that it's a friend. And more often it's a peer as well, but it could be somebody who's older or younger in that church community or in the environment that they're in. Closely followed by, as you can see there at 31%, we're a family member. So again, think about your context. How many, if you've got young people in your wider community in your church, if they know you're a Christian, you're in really close proximity to them, which gives us great opportunity, doesn't it, again, to be thinking prayerfully, being intentional as to how we might reach them. Let's go on to the next slide, which reveals, as you said, so what do they think of us? Well, the media has always painted, to my mind, a very negative portrayal, hasn't it, of us as Christians. We're dull, we're rule-abiding, we're closed in our churches and so on. Let me just pause on this to actually completely kibosh and dispel that myth. That is not what people across the UK think of us as practicing Christians. And I pause on that just to say that should really make us sit up because, as you can see here, they think we're caring, we're good-humoured, we're friendly, and we're generous. Isn't that a good place to start? That should almost make, it certainly does me, it makes me sit up to just go, oh, okay, so the young people, or indeed my peers, or um, older people in our communities, whatever, if they know we're a practicing Christian, not only are we in really close proximity, but you know what? They really like us, and they think well of us. So even if they don't know you, even if the young people in your families, your communities, don't necessarily know you really well, chances are their perception of you is a really positive one. 
And again, that should give us a springboard, hadn't it, to just make that approach, have that conversation, express a bit of interest, ask how they're doing, ask if they've got any exams or mock exams or revision or work experience or how it's going at school. Um, because actually you will be well received. I know as a mum of teenagers, I'm not always well received with my own boys. But when I see them interact with people in church, they talk beautifully. So frustrating, isn't it? I'm sure many of you know what that feels like as a parent. But our young people will respond. Our culture paints a negative picture of young people, which is often not the case. It paints a negative picture of us as Christians, which, as we see here, is not reflected in what people really think. What is interesting, again, here's a challenge for us on the next slide, is when we ask those non-Christians of their reflections of the people that they knew, that was positive. When we've asked their reflections of some of the churches as an institution, there comes some challenge, not altogether as positive. As you can see, their reflections of the church may be that 26% of the UK said they thought the church could be hypocritical. 26% said they thought the church could be narrow-minded. But the third top answer towards the top, as you see, is that they think the, fr the church can be friendly. So it's not all bad news, is it? That sense of actually they see us, we've got some challenge there in terms of how we come across, how we engage, how we welcome, how we draw people into our communities. But actually they know that we're friendly. But what this drives us back to is that actually the best bridge to evangelism, the best bridge to share in the gospel, the best bridge to share in that good news of light and hope and truth is you, it's me, us as individuals. We are the ones who in stepping out, maybe with a bit more boldness and a bit more courage than maybe might feel comfortable at times, but actually we are the best bridge to reach those people around us. And they think well of us, as we've just heard. Let's go on to the next slide. Um, this is the bold and brazen, as you can see here, because this to me is one of the most encouraging um, statistics that came out of our talk in Jesus research and it says this it says one in three non-Christians when asked if you've had a conversation with a Christian that you know and again this could be younger or older because it correlates with other youth research as well but one in three people asked if you've had a conversation would you be willing and open to go again and this is what we found that one in three people said yes isn't that astounding and do you know what makes this even better news is that, again, going back to compare and contrast with 2015, this was, seven years ago, this was actually one in five. So what it shows us is that over the course of seven years, which, of course, as we all know, we have been through an awful lot, haven't we, as a nation, as the UK, that actually through that time of feeling... And young people, I don't know about you, I think teenagers... 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 year olds plus, I think they were the hardest hit by COVID um, because all of that early years development into their teens was quashed and all of the youth groups, like everything else, came to an end. And actually some of that development was really, they didn't, couldn't quite rationalise in the same way maybe us as adults. Um, but when the walls closed in, actually, it drove many of them into that social media presence, which my belief is, whilst there's lots of good about the internet and social media, I do believe there is, and my sons um, really engage with Christian TikTok, we need more of that. I'm hearing many church leaders nationally, in fact, at least a dozen last year, said to me personally through my work at the EA that they are seeing more people, particularly younger, come through the doors of their churches as a direct result of having engaged with good Christian content on TikTok or YouTube. Isn't that amazing? The Holy Spirit is not even using us some of the time. It's going through TikTok and other things to really make that impact on our young people's lives. So all of those things are working together to really um, draw young people and older people to himself. Let's go on to the next slide. We've only got a few minutes, so bear with me to just um, bring it into a little bit of a close um, off the back of this. We asked our practicing Christians, how does it feel to you in those conversations with, again, people in your communities about Jesus? And we found this. People are really confident, surprisingly so. 75% of people said, we know the Great Commission is our role to really speak something of the truth of Jesus. 77% said they felt confident. 40% fear the big questions, often with engaging with our young people. We sometimes fear how they might react to us, but also what they might ask. But as was alluded to earlier, actually to just be involved in conversation, 
to actually not always have the answers, to do life in the raw with young people, I think is, and I see all the time, is really appreciated by young people, whether we have the answers or not. But to journey alongside them is something really pivotal for our young people as well. But this last one, again, produces an alert for us. 42% of Christians said that they just didn't find themselves in spaces alongside non-Christians to actually be sharing the gospel with them. Again, big alert here. We need to be people who are outward looking, yes, within our churches, but also within our communities. Where are those young people who need us, who need our input, um, and who would see something of the love of God through us, through our proximity, and being involved in those conversations? Let's flick forward again. People remember the dialogue. And that just reiterates what we were saying earlier. Again, this is mirrored absolutely in what I see in my young people. They don't need us, me, to tell them the whole gospel in one go. They need me to ask them. Top answer, 33% of people said they remember the conversation. They remember being asked what they believe, what they think. Closely followed by 30% of people who went on to say that then that person went on to share something of their own life and faith journey. May we be people that, again, spend time to simply ask good questions, to be interested, to get involved in the lives of young people in our context and our community. Let's move on again, just a couple more slides. If we can um, flick through, so I just want to really hone it as we close just into actually how this resonates for us alongside our young people. People come to faith through all manner of different ways. We see particularly um, through growing up in a Christian family, that pivotal inf um, influence. And for you, for many of you as church leaders, to invest in that whole family discipleship is really key. How can we support and cheer on and champion our parents in investing in their own children? As we go through again, if we can flick through, you can see people come to faith in all manner of different ways, through Sunday schools, through, through youth groups, through Alpha courses, through Christianity Explored, many, many things. As we go on to the next slide, we see that for over 18s, it is often the top answer, as you can see, 23% said that they come to faith through a particular life event. And my belief is that this is often mirrored with our young people as well. Whether that's a big transition, it may be a breakup of a family or changing school. It may be something really good like having a younger sibling or, um, or friends and family members getting married. Whatever it is, these life events, spot them would be my encouragement. Whether it's GCSEs, whether it is a family breakup, whether it's the loss of a grandparent, these are moments in time that whilst we wouldn't often wish some of the negative ones on our young people, there are moments in time where the Holy Spirit can use you and use us to really bring something of that acknowledgement and love and care and truth of the gospel into their lives. Because we asked practicing Christians what was significant life event came about as the top answer. I've got two more slides just to leave you with, if that's okay, and then I'll hand back. This one is not one to be skipped over. It's not new news. Many bits of research over previous decades have resonated this. But again, our Talking Jesus research, when we asked, at what age did you, as a practicing Christian today, at what age did you come to faith? As you can see, the great news is people come to faith at all ages. I work a lot with Faith in Later Life, which is ministering to those who are age 55, 65 and plus. And I thought they'd be really discouraged by this, 3%. But they're not. They weren't. Because people come to faith at all ages. But isn't it interesting for us today, as we think about growing younger and investing in our young and seeking God's heart for our young, it is a pivotal age, as I'm sure you know already, but that so many young people, the vast majority of people come to faith under the age of 18. So as churches, as youth groups, as ministries, as people who don't yet have young people in our communities... That is a key area where we should put vision and strategy and finance and energy and prayer so that people would be reached because it's all that exploration of life, isn't it, and questioning that actually God can really encounter people at a young age. Last slide, if we can go on um, a couple more, please. Thank you. I'll tell you where to stop. Let's flick forward. So let me just land with us on this. How can all of this and forgive me, I've not had the time to pull out, again, much of the richness of this Talking Jesus report and how it correlates with 
other research like the influencers research, um, the open generation, connected generation research from Barna as well. If you're interested in that, do come and speak to me. But how can this help influence us in terms of how and where we can be proactive alongside our young people. Well, I'd love to just briefly um, suggest this, that young people in our communities are more open to exploring faith than we might actually imagine. Um, I was reading something um, early, early this week um, from the Influencers Report that said that, and it really challenged me because it said that 48% of churches are actually just seeking after retention, i.e. just keeping those one or two or three or a greater number of young people. But actually, people outside of our church walls, in our schools, on our football pitches, in our gyms, wherever they may be, are really open, actually, to seeking something that would help them make... Um, make sense of life and all that they're going through. So people are really open. And again, let that in just embolden us and encourage us that to even start conversations um, could lead somewhere really positive. They live in a world of confusion, don't they? I see that again on the eye line of my boys in secondary school. And there's so much grey, isn't there? But actually, my firm belief is that the grey doesn't help young people. Actually, whether that's that we speak to them in trusted relationships that they might form with you or with me, about actually not being afraid to have an opinion, to have a Bible-rooted opinion that says, you know what, my belief about this topic or that topic is actually this, because it's based on what the Bible says about this. Actually, my, my feeling and my finding with my young people is they just like knowing a kind of black and white. This is what I believe, or this is what the Bible says, and then they can navigate that territory and come to a decision as well. So they live in a world of confusion, lots of anxiety, well-being, we know all of that, and they need truth. And we know that the gospel good news brings that in abundance. Young people are more connected than ever, as we know, and yet their relationships have never been so shallow. Um, that's, again, come through lots of research, again, and you can imagine that, can't you, through the world of liking, following, connecting, Snapchat stories, this, that, and the other. And yet, what do we as the church have at our heart? Well, we're wired for relationship, aren't we? And just lastly, as it said on that slide there, it takes a village to raise a child, doesn't it? I'm a big belief that I can not even start to tell you how grateful I am for the many adults in my church who I see every Sunday approach one or other or both of my boys and just go and give them a hug, and Jacob's up here, and he still will give them a hug back, and just say, hey, Jacob, Isaac, how was your week? How did your football match go? Or when is it you've got your work experience coming up? And so on and so forth. But just say, it takes a village, doesn't it? And for every single person young or old, who pours a nugget of something, love, care, light, truth, hope, the gospel good news into a young person's life. Let me just reassure you, and I'm sure we know already, but my hope, my prayer, and I'm sure yours as well, and on behalf of the dice, would be, let us pray that these relationships, these little buds, just like that growing younger, the little leaf, that each of, the, each of those little starting conversations will be transformational in the lives of our young people, because who knows what could happen and where God would lead them, just that in the same way that you are sat here today, because one or two or three key people invested in your life. So that's not even a start of the 10, but I hope that as I close and hand back to Rhiannon, if I wonder if I could just pray for us, if that's okay, I'll hand back to you. Um, just that maybe something of the big picture research might just fuel you with some encouragement as we contextualize it into thinking, Lord, what does this look like for us? What does our context present itself? And even down to the micro of you and of me, who might God have put in your sphere of influence, in your peer group, in your church group, in your family that God might help you to minister to? If that's okay, I'm just going to pray for us, if that's all right, and then hand back. Father God, I just thank you that we have the privilege of journeying with you and we have the privilege of sharing your heart. And Lord, so I just pray for myself and for my friends here. Lord, would you just gift us with even more of a heart for the young people who may be existingly or even in the future may be in our communities, both inside the church and in the wider community. I pray, Lord, that off the back of some of that encouragement is just how open people are, and yet for so many, young and old, against a devastating backdrop of anxiety or of trauma or of pain or of just seeking out the big answers to questions of life. Lord, would you use each one of us individually 
to just maybe think of the one or two people that you might have us pray for, speak to, or minister to. I pray for us as the wider church, Lord. Would you help our communities to spot those young people and to just know with all your wisdom and insight how to interact with them? And I just pray, Lord, for Ipswich Deanery and Diocese too, Lord. Would you do something transformational? Help us, Lord, to grow younger, to sense your heart, to be able to just, with a whole new wave of your Holy Spirit, interact with young people where they are. And we pray, Lord, that this would be a year of great favor, that many, many more young people would come to know you and have an encounter with you as a direct result of how you use us in that ministry. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Rachel, for sharing uh, with us your message and this research. Please do take that away and digest it in your own time. This looks like there's lots of good challenge and encouragement there. And I hope that you're taking away from what Rhiannon and Rachel said, that like, I so often get asked, if I'm going to do youth work, do I need to be up to speed with the TikToks? Do I have to be young? Do I have to be like, really ingrained in youth culture? The answer to that, thankfully, is no. The, <laughs> the answer to that is actually, how about we reach out to the young people around us and explore youth culture with them? Remember that she said that one of the key things they remembered was that they asked them what they believed, how they felt. So be really encouraged with that. You don't need to know it all, but we do need to be a village that's going to help raise the children in Ipswich Deanery. So be encouraged. Um, another great thing from...